Did Jesus Really Exist? Refuting the Jesus Myth Hypothesis The Jesus Myth Hypothesis What is it? In recent times, the Internet has been flooded by atheists and other non-Christians arguing that the early church borrowed material from pagan myths in order to construct the Jesus of the Bible. This theory is called the Jesus Myth Hypothesis. Leading voices in this movement include Robert Price and Richard Carrier, as well as the Zeitgeist movie. Proponents of the Jesus myth hypothesis argue either that Jesus of Nazareth never existed or that he existed, but the miraculous aspects of his life were merely borrowed from pagan mythology. This paper will examine how some leading non-Christian New Testament scholars have responded to the Jesus myth hypothesis, as well as how several Christian scholars have addressed this issue. Parallels between Jesus and pagan gods will be briefly explored. Finally, suggestions will be made as to how the evangelical apologist can strengthen his case against the Jesus myth hypothesis. Non-Christian scholars respond to the Jesus myth hypothesis. Several non-Christian New Testament scholars have voiced their displeasure with Jesus myth proponents. This paper will briefly address the concerns of two non-Christian scholars, Bart Ehrman and Maurice Casey. The views they express is consistent with the consensus of the vast majority of New Testament scholars today. Bart Ehrman is the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He has written numerous books attempting to discredit the credibility of the New Testament documents and traditional Christianity. He is certainly no ally of evangelical Christianity. Still, he is opposed to the Jesus myth hypothesis. In fact, in 2012, Ehrman authored Did Jesus Exist? The Historical Argument for Jesus of Nazareth. Ehrman acknowledges that no serious historian or New Testament scholar should deny that Jesus of Nazareth existed in the first century AD and that he died by crucifixion around 30 AD. Ehrman states, at a reputable university, of course, professors cannot teach simply anything. They need to be academically responsible and reflect the views of scholarship. That is probably why there are no mythicists, at least to my knowledge. Teaching religious studies at accredited universities in North America or Europe, their views are not widely seen as academically respectable by members of the academy. Ehrman goes on to argue that there is no unambiguous evidence for dying and rising gods before Christianity began, and that there is no evidence that pagan gods were worshipped in rural Palestine during the time of Christ. Ehrman relates that even the enemies of Christianity admitted Jesus was a real historical person. Ehrman states that there are too many early sources dating back to immediately after his life to deny Jesus' existence. Ehrman notes the several oral traditions, i.e. creeds and hymns quoted in the New Testament, and early sermons of the first twelve chapters of Acts that were originated in the early thirties A.D. that speak concerning Jesus' life. Ehrman argues that the Apostle Paul knew about the historical Jesus and that Paul met Jesus' disciple Peter and Jesus' brother James. Ehrman adds that Jesus' death by crucifixion is almost universally accepted by scholars today. One reason for this is that no first century Jew would have invented the idea of a crucified Messiah. Hence, Ehrman, a leading non-Christian New Testament scholar, concludes there is far too much early evidence for Jesus' life and death for the Jesus myth hypothesis to be credible. Maurice Casey was the emeritus professor at the University of Nottingham until his death in 2014. Before his death, he authored a work entitled Jesus, Evidence and Argument or Mythicist Myths. Evangelical scholars Gary R. Habermas and Benjamin C. F. Shaw reviewed Casey's book in a 2016 edition of Philosophia Christi. Habermas and Shaw state that Casey identified himself as an agnostic with atheist leanings. Hence, like Bart Ehrman, Casey is no friend of evangelical Christianity. 
Cathy accuses the mythicists of having no semblance of an unbiased historical method to their research. Instead, the Jesus mythers allow their biases and prejudices to dictate what they will accept or reject from history. Casey argues for very early dates for Mark's Gospel, 40 AD, and Matthew's Gospel, 50 to 60 AD, but his 80 to 90 AD date for Luke is more in line with conventional New Testament criticism. Hence, Casey is outraged by the late dates many mythers give to the Synoptic Gospels, some mythers dating them a full century later than the dates arrived at by critical scholars today. Casey notes that Jesus' mythers need these late dates for the Synoptic Gospels to give their wild speculative theories any appearance of credibility. Casey argues that the Jesus' mythers usually are speaking well outside their fields of expertise and they often use outdated scholarship. If they don't like something asserted in the New Testament, they often classify it as a later edition inserted into the text, even if there is no textual evidence for a later interpolation. Casey also attacks the idea that the miraculous aspects of Jesus' life were copied from pagan myths. He finds much of this speculation to be embarrassing and pseudo-scholarship. Many of the dying and rising God stories of pagan mythology actually post-date Christianity. Other supposed parallels with pagan myths are not really similar at all to the Gospel accounts. Casey concludes that the Jesus myth hypothesis is unscholarly and verifiably false. As noted above, Bart Ehrman and Maurice Casey are examples of two well-respected, non-Christian New Testament critics who reject the scholarship and credibility of those who promote the Jesus myth hypothesis. At this point, responses to the Jesus myth hypothesis given by evangelical Christian scholars will be addressed. Christian scholars respond to the Jesus myth hypothesis. Two Christian scholars who have effectively responded to this objection to Christianity are Ronald Nash, author of The Gospel and the Greeks, and J.P. Moreland, author of Scaling the Secular City. Nash originally wrote his Christianity and the Hellenistic World in 1984, and then updated his work in 1992 and 2003. Moreland referred to Nash's work in his Scaling the Secular City, Moreland pointed out that there are numerous differences between the New Testament information about Jesus and the data found in ancient myths. First, there is a long gap in between the original recording of ancient myths and the time when the myth supposedly occurred. In fact, in most cases, the subject of the myth is not even a historical person or event. In the case of the New Testament Jesus, the entire New Testament was written during a time when eyewitnesses who knew Jesus were still alive and leading the church. The entire New Testament should be dated to the first century AD. In fact, ancient creeds, Colossians 1, 15-17, Philippians 2, 5-11, Romans 10, 9, 2 Corinthians 5, 15, etc., that speak of Jesus' deity, resurrection, and substitutionary death probably go back to the decade in which Jesus died, the late 30s AD. As the historian and expert on ancient mythology A. N. Sherwin White has stated, legends or myths need at least two generations to get started and gain acceptance. Roman Society, pages 186 through 193. With the New Testament portrait of Jesus, there is simply not enough time for a myth to have developed. The Jesus of the Gospels is the true Jesus of history. Second, usually myths that sound like forerunners of Christianity were actually written after the New Testament writings were complete. Hence, if borrowing occurred, it was probably pagan mythology that borrowed from Christianity. It is difficult, if not impossible, to identify pre-Christian myths that depict a full-blown incarnation, death, and resurrection of a savior figure. When myths take on these ideas, it seems that they post-date Christianity. Third, adherents of the mystery religions were synchronistic. 
They liked to blend beliefs from other religions with their own beliefs. Christianity, on the other hand, like Judaism from which it came, were very exclusive. The early church, like first century Judaism, did not borrow from other religions. The early church believed that all non-Christian religions were false and that salvation comes only through Jesus. In short, the early church was not inclined to borrow from the pagan religions and their myths. In fact, many Christians were persecuted and martyred because they refused to blend Christianity with pagan beliefs. Fourth, J.P. Moreland points out that the similarities between the Gospels and the pagan myths are often exaggerated by skeptics. In fact, often the myths only look similar to the Gospel if Christian terminology is used to describe them or if Christian themes are smuggled into these myths. Fifth, the ancient mystery religions had more concern about the religious experience or emotional states of their followers than for correct doctrine. Early Christianity, conversely, had a large emphasis on history and correct doctrine. Its focus was not primarily on the subjective state of its adherents. Sixth, the writers of the ancient myths did not write as if they expected their readers to take them literally. Yet, the gospel authors wrote as if they were recording real history. They informed their readers concerning the identity of current leaders, the time of the year, descriptions of the location, and other key factors which would enable their reader to place the events in their proper historical, chronological, and geographical setting. This is not the case with the ancient myths. Seventh, the vast majority of the world's leading New Testament scholars no longer try to trace the origin of Christianity to pagan myths. It is now widely accepted by New Testament scholarship that the ancient Jewish faith is the root of New Testament Christianity, not Greek or Roman mythology. Besides Nash and Moreland, other evangelical Christian scholars have addressed the Jesus myth hypothesis. These include Paul Rhodes Eddy and Gregory A. Boyd, Mary Jo Sharp, Mark W. Foreman, Michael Lacona, Edwin Yamuchi, and Craig A. Evans. Many other evangelicals have addressed the Jesus myth hypothesis, but this list will suffice to show that evangelical scholars are presently offering refutations of this view. What follows is material drawn from the responses of the above listed evangelical scholars. A Closer Look at Pagan Dying and Rising Gods when a closer examination is made of the ancient pagan dying and rising gods, the supposed similarities with the New Testament portrait of Jesus disappear. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a group of biblical scholars called the History of Religions School argued that the early church borrowed from ancient pagan myths to create the Jesus of the Bible. But over 100 years of New Testament critical scholarship has shown that this is not the case. A few examples of ancient deities will suffice to show that the parallels were greatly exaggerated. Adonis is not spoken of as risen in the fullest sense until after Christianity in texts that seem to be influenced by Christianity. Addis is depicted as dying but not rising. In fact, Addis is not portrayed as being deity at all. The Egyptian god Osiris is murdered and dismembered, with pieces of his body scattered. The pieces of his body are collected and reassembled, with one piece missing. Osiris then becomes a powerful god in the underworld. He does not return to life on earth. This is not a full-blown bodily resurrection. In fact, some refer to it as a zombification. Osiris' son Horus is bitten by a poisonous snake and then healed by his mother Isis. But this is certainly not the resurrection to immortality we see in Christ's resurrection. Nor did Horus die a sacrificial death for others, as Jesus did. Mithraism is very hard to decipher since there are very few texts that deal with its teachings. Edwin Yamauchi states that even Mithras was worshipped as a Persian deity as early as the 14th century BC. There is no data to indicate Mithraism was a mystery religion in the West until well after the birth of Christianity. 
Hence, it did not influence the teachings of the early church. Also, Mithras was not born of a virgin. Supposedly, he was born out of a rock. The Amauchi also notes that there is no death or resurrection accounts in Mithraism. In rare cases in Mithraism, a bull was slaughtered on a grate above an initiate, drenching him in blood. This was called a taurobolium. This practice did not begin until about 160 AD, and it was not until around 375 AD that this gory ritual was associated with rebirth and eternal life. If borrowing occurred, Mithraism borrowed from Christianity, not the other way around. Tammuz, also known as Dumuzi, was allowed to spend half the year in the realm of the living while his sister took his place in the realm of the dead. Again, this is not the full-blown resurrection to immortality seen in the Gospels' depiction of Jesus' resurrection. Baal, Isis, and Dionysus also fail miserably as examples of dying and rising gods. The failure of ancient pagan myths to explain the bodily resurrection of Jesus has led renowned Swedish scholar and professor at Lund University, T.N.D. Mettinger, to write, There is, as far as I am aware, no prima facie evidence that the death and resurrection of Jesus is a mythological construct drawing on the myths and rites of the dying and rising gods of the surrounding world. While studied with profit against the background of Jewish resurrection belief, the faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus retains its unique character in the history of religions. Due to the failure to find adequate parallels in ancient pagan religions, some Jesus mythicists have looked to real historical figures who had miracles attributed to them by their followers shortly after their deaths. Three examples will suffice. Apollonius of Tyana died in the late 90s AD. The only source for his life is Philostratus' Life of Apollonius, which was written over 100 years after Apollonius' death. There is almost complete silence concerning him before this. Philostratus was paid by Empress Julia Domna to write a biography of Apollonius, possibly to rehabilitate his poor reputation as a fraud and a magician, and to counter the growing Christian faith. It is certainly possible that Philostratus, in order to rival the growing Christian faith, may have borrowed material from the Gospels, applying this material to Apollonius. Philostratus offers no details concerning Apollonius's death and no reports of any resurrection appearances. Apollonius is only supposed to have been seen by a doubting disciple in a dream. Philostratus's work is riddled with geographical and historical inaccuracies, such as Apollonius visiting the cities of Nineveh and Babylon. Even though these cities were uninhabited in the first century AD, Apollonius has no followers today. He fails miserably as a true parallel to Jesus of Nazareth. Sabbatai Sfi is also proposed as a parallel of Jesus, yet his own prophet, Nathan of Gaza, denied that Sfi ever performed any miracles. There are no reports of anyone ever seeing Sfi after his death. Some believe Sfi may have been mentally ill. When confronted by Muslims, he denied that he was the Jewish Messiah and converted to Islam. His followers forsook him after his conversion to Islam, after Svi died, his prophet Nathan said he would return and set up God's kingdom, but instead, Nathan also died. Simon Kimbangu was an African who lived in the Congo and supposedly performed miracles between 1921 and 1951. He died in a Congo prison in 1951. There was never any report that he rose from the dead in any way, shape, or form. Though some of his followers deified him after his death, he himself never claimed to be God. He claimed to merely be a Christian pastor who performed miracles in the power of God. He rejected the titles of God or Messiah for himself. Most of his several million followers consider him to have been a Christian prophet who preached Jesus and performed miracles. Hence, Kimbangu was either a charlatan or a true miracle-working Christian prophet. Either way, it falls far short of providing evidence that Jesus lived a non-miraculous life but was quickly deified by his followers and given supernatural powers. The Historical Case for Jesus 
Unlike the fictional gods of the pagan myths, a strong case can be made for the existence of Jesus of Nazareth in the first century AD. First, there are ancient creeds found in the New Testament which critical scholars date back to the early 30s AD, the earliest days of Christianity. These creeds were either creeds or hymns. They were either recited or sung in the early church before the New Testament was written. These creeds not only acknowledge that Jesus existed, but they also attribute deity to him. They state that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, and that he appeared to many people after his death. This gives extremely early evidence that Jesus existed and that he lived a miraculous life. Second, the sermons found in Acts chapters 1 through 12 are acknowledged by critical scholars as the earliest preaching of the Christian church, dating back to the early 30s AD. These sermons contain the primitive preaching of the early church. The theology found in these sermons was undeveloped. They lack the theological development found in Paul's writings, but Paul began to write his letters around 49 to 50 AD. Hence, these sermons go back to the earliest days of Christianity. Yet, these primitive sermons report not only that Jesus existed, but that he died by crucifixion, rose from the dead, and appeared to many people. Third, seven of Paul's letters, i.e. Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, and Philemon, are accepted by the vast majority of New Testament scholars as authentic letters written by Paul between 49 and 61 AD. Christian historian Paul Barnett lists several aspects of Jesus' life that are mentioned in Paul's accepted letters. These include... Jesus was descended from Abraham, Galatians 3, 16, and David, Romans 1, 3. He was born of a woman, Galatians 4, 4. He lived under Jewish law, Galatians 4, 4. He was a humble servant of others, Philippians 2, 7 through 8. He was abused and insulted during his life, Romans 15, 3. He had a brother named James, as well as other brothers, Galatians 1, 19, 1 Corinthians 9, 5. His disciple Peter was married, 1 Corinthians 9, 5, Mark 1, 30. He instituted a memorial meal with his disciples on the night he was betrayed, 1 Corinthians 11, 23-25. He was executed by the Jewish religious leaders of Judea, 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 15. He was buried, but rose on the third day, and he appeared to many witnesses on several different occasions. 1 Corinthians 15, 4 through 8. This provides strong historical evidence that Paul acknowledged that Jesus lived in the recent past. Fourth, the manuscript evidence for the New Testament documents proves the New Testament books all date within the generation of Jesus' contemporaries. We now have in existence fragments and copies of New Testament books that date back to the 2nd century A.D. Some scholars would even argue for fragments dating to the 1st century A.D., showing the New Testament writings to be 1st century A.D. documents. Characters from ancient mythology have no such historical confirmation for their existence. Fifth. Evidence for Jesus' existence and miraculous life can be found in the earliest writings of the Church Fathers. These Church Fathers are called the Apostolic Fathers. They were either contemporaries of the original Apostles or the leading students of the Apostles. Whatever the case, they were selected for leadership in the early Church. Their writings date from 60 to 120 AD. The Apostolic Fathers include Clement of Rome, Ignatius, Polycarp, Papias, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermas, and the Didact. The writings of the Apostolic Fathers quote from or allude to almost every New Testament book. The writings attest to the facts that Jesus existed in the first century AD, he claimed to be Messiah and Savior, he died on the cross for man's sins, and he bodily rose from the dead. Sixth, even non-Christian authors of ancient times acknowledged in their writings that Jesus existed in the 1st century A.D. Thallus, 52 A.D., Josephus, 97 A.D., 
Pliny the Younger and Emperor Trajan, 112 AD, Cornelius Tacitus, 115 AD, Suetonius and Emperor Hadrian, 117 to 138 AD, and the Jewish Talmud, 70 to 200 AD, all mention Jesus in their writings and talk about him as a person who really did exist in the first century AD. Even the ancient 2nd century AD heretical writings of the Gnostics affirm that Jesus of Nazareth did in fact exist in the 1st century AD. In fact, Geisler and Turek point out that Jesus was mentioned by 43 ancient authors within 150 years of his life, whereas Emperor Tiberius, the Roman emperor of Jesus' day, was only mentioned by 10 ancient authors within 150 years of his life. Obviously, there exists ample evidence to establish that Jesus of Nazareth existed in the first century A.D. He was not a myth. A Christian Response to the Jesus Myth Hypothesis Based on the work of the evangelical scholars listed above, a strong case can be made against the Jesus Myth Hypothesis. First, current historical and critical scholarship acknowledges that Jesus of Nazareth existed. The Christ myth theory of the 19th century has been thoroughly discredited by critical scholars themselves. Hence, the burden of proof is on the Jesus mythicists to make their case. At this point, their view is not considered credible in scholarly circles. Second, the early church had Jewish Old Testament roots. The early church was comprised primarily of Jews. Ancient Jews did not embrace pagan beliefs or borrow from pagan myths. This is why ancient Jews and ancient Christians faced persecution and death for refusing to say, Caesar is Lord, when ordered to do so. They would not mix their religious beliefs with pagan religious doctrines. The teachings of the early church were built upon the foundation of Jewish religious thought as found in the Old Testament. Jesus' life and ministry were not borrowed from pagan myths. Third, even the ancient enemies of Christianity acknowledged that Jesus existed. The Jewish Talmud, the ancient oral traditions of the Jewish rabbis in written form, admitted that Jesus was crucified under the authority of Pontius Pilate. The Talmud does not deny that Jesus existed. Around 150 AD, a Jewish lawyer named Trypho argued that Jesus was not the Messiah. But Trypho never tried to claim that Jesus never existed. Fourth, there is no unambiguous evidence of pagan dying and rising gods before the advent of Christianity. If borrowing occurred, it was the pagan myths that borrowed from Christianity. Christianity did not borrow from pagan myths. Fifth, seven of the Apostle Paul's letters are almost universally accepted as Pauline letters by New Testament critical scholars today. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, Philemon, and 1 Thessalonians. Paul began writing these letters only 20 years after Jesus lived and died. As mentioned above, in these letters, Paul taught many aspects of Jesus' life. This is early evidence for the existence of Jesus, his death, and resurrection. Sixth, similarities between Christianity and pagan religions are greatly exaggerated. In fact, the adherents of the Jesus myth hypothesis often deceptively describe pagan beliefs using Christian terminology. This superficially creates the illusion that Christianity and the ancient pagan myths have much in common, when in reality they do not. Seventh, pagan myths are often based on seasonal cycles, not on real history. In the fall and winter, vegetation dies. In the spring, it comes back to life. But this is not the case with Christianity. Christianity is not based on the seasonal cycles. In Christianity, there is much ancient evidence for Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. The earliest evidence can be found in the ancient creeds, hymns, and sermons found in the New Testament. Some of these ancient creeds, hymns, and sermons go back to within a few years of Jesus' resurrection. Eighth, Ancient pagans almost universally reject the concept of a bodily resurrection. 
The goal was for the soul to escape from the bondage of the body, not a future reanimation of the body. The goal was the platonic immortality of the soul, not bodily resurrection. Bodily resurrection was a Jewish and Christian belief. It was a belief not shared by ancient pagans. Ninth, ancient Jews would not have invented the story of a crucified Messiah. The Messiah was to be the ultimate king of Israel. Even non-Christian scholar Bart Ehrman admits that the early church, which was Jewish, would never fabricate the story of the Jewish Messiah being crucified, a very shameful way to die at the hands of pagan Gentiles. This is one reason why virtually all historical and religious scholars believe Jesus died by crucifixion around 30 AD. And 10th, parallels do not automatically prove borrowing occurred. Christian philosopher Mark Foreman makes this point clear when he compares the Lincoln assassination with the Kennedy assassination. Many similarities, real or imagined, exist between the two assassinations. Yet, the Kennedy assassination narrative was not a myth based upon the details of the Lincoln assassination. Lincoln was elected to Congress in 1846, Kennedy in 1946. Lincoln was elected the President of the United States in 1860, Kennedy in 1960. Lincoln's vice president's last name was Johnson. So was Kennedy's vice president. Lincoln and Kennedy were both assassinated by a gunshot to the head by a lone gunman. Their assassins both had three names consisting of 15 letters. Both assassins were killed by a gunshot wound a few days later after the assassinations and before they could stand trial. Many other parallels between the Lincoln and Kennedy assassinations exist. Still, both of these assassinations really occurred in history. Even real parallels do not prove the later event borrowed from the earlier event. Another example of this is presented by Christian apologist Greg Kokel. Kokel discusses a 19th century novel that predates the sinking of the Titanic. The 1898 novel was titled Futility. The novel talks about a fictional massive ship thought to be indestructible called the Titan. While on a transatlantic voyage from England to New York, in the middle of an April night, it struck an iceberg and sank. In this fictional novel, many people perished due to the lack of enough lifeboats. All these details of the novel closely parallel numerous details of the sinking of the Titanic. Still, the sinking of the Titanic really did occur in history. Hence, parallels that predate an event do not necessarily prove that the later event is a myth. A few comments by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was open to the possibility that some of the ancient myths of a God-man savior who dies and rises may predate biblical Christianity, even though no evidence for these myths predating Christianity exists. But Lewis saw this, even if true, as no obstacle to Christian belief. Lewis believed the first preaching of the gospel was found in the Garden of Eden, just after Adam and Eve fell into sin. God promised that a man would be born of woman, the seed of the woman, who would save mankind by defeating Satan, the one who spoke through the serpent, but the Savior would be bruised in the process. Genesis 3.15 Therefore, reasoned Lewis, all of ancient mankind had some remembrance of the promise of a coming, suffering Savior who would redeem mankind from the curse. Also, Lewis appreciated God's revelation to mankind through nature. Hence, the four seasons may have been given to mankind as a hint of the coming Redeemer. In winter, nature dies, but it is reborn or resurrected in the spring. Many of the ancient myths had to do with the seasons and the production of crops. Yet, God may have given ancient pagans hints about the coming Redeemer, so that when he came, died, and rose, he would fulfill the hope of many pagans who were living in the expectancy of a dying and rising God. Lewis viewed the ancient myths as signposts, pointing to the day when God would become a man, die for our sins, and rise from the dead. Although Lewis viewed the incarnation, God the Son becoming a man, as the myth that came true, he also noted that the Gospels were written as if the authors were recording straightforward history, not mythology. 
In other words, as an expert on ancient mythology, Lewis realized that the Gospels were not written in the genre or literary style of mythology. They were written as if the authors were recording ancient history. Strengthening the Christian Response to the Jesus Myth Hypothesis As strong as the evangelical case against the Jesus Myth Hypothesis is, it can be strengthened still. For evangelical scholars have conceded far too much evidence to New Testament critics. If evangelical scholars free themselves from the shackles of New Testament criticism, much more evidence for the historicity of Christ and the refutation of the Jesus myth hypothesis can be utilized. First, evangelical scholars need to rely less heavily on the consensus of New Testament critical scholarship. So much of the New Testament is rejected as non-historical by New Testament scholars today. If evangelicals rely less on the consensus of critical scholarship and more on the writings of the early church fathers, the historical reliability of the New Testament would be on much firmer ground. New Testament scholarship is based upon several unwarranted assumptions. There is no need for evangelical scholars to blindly accept critical speculation. Second, Evangelical scholars should reject Markan priority and other dependence theories of the Synoptic Gospels. They should return to the independence theory of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Until the emergence of Enlightenment rationalism, Christian scholars accepted the traditional authorship of the four Gospels. Christian scholars believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote independently of each other. Hence, the Gospels were treated as four distinct and reliable witnesses to the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Evangelical scholars should once again promote this confidence in the reliability and independence of the four Gospels that was held by the Church until the advent of Enlightenment rationalism. Third, Evangelical scholars should consider returning to the earlier dates and the traditional authorship of the four Gospels and the rest of the New Testament books as well. Instead, many evangelical scholars are open to unknown authors writing three of the Gospels, i.e. Matthew, Luke, and John. They entertain the possibility that Paul did not write all 13 of his letters. In short, Numerous evangelical scholars and apologists now adhere to many of the unwarranted views of critical, liberal, neo-orthodox scholars. Fourth, evangelical scholars should not embrace a popular view within critical circles that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written in the genre of Greco-Roman biography. If the early church borrowed the writing style of their pagan neighbors, then maybe the early church also borrowed from their myths as well. This is a dangerous path for evangelicals to take. Finally, evangelical scholars should reject the critical practice of transforming some of the gospel miracles into mere metaphors. If evangelicals concede that some of the gospel miracles are mythological or metaphorical, then the case for Jesus' resurrection and deity will be greatly weakened. Conclusion The Jesus found on the pages of the New Testament is not a myth, nor was he borrowed from ancient myths. The New Testament was written by reliable eyewitnesses who were sincere enough about their beliefs that they were willing to die for their beliefs. They were not telling stories. The Gospel writers did not borrow from ancient myths. They reported accurately what they saw and heard concerning Jesus. Men do not die for legends or myths. The apostles were willing to suffer and die for Jesus because they witnessed his miracles and his post-resurrection appearances. They saw him fulfill numerous Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah. They believed his claims to be God, Messiah, and Savior. Hence, they were willing to die for Jesus, the true Jesus of history, not a mythological fairy tale Jesus. Hence, Paul could make a clear distinction between such things as sound doctrine and truth on the one hand, and myths or fables of false teachers on the other hand. 2 Timothy 4, 3-4 As the Apostle Peter wrote, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ 
but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 2 Peter 1, 16. Though a person is free to choose to reject the New Testament accounts, it is clear that the New Testament authors were not writing mythology. They claimed they were recording reliable history, and the evidence of the historicity of their claims is substantial. Therefore, there is no historical foundation for the Jesus myth hypothesis.